When a season is put together, of course, we're trying to get a balance of operas. We need uh, generally some that are dramatic and sometimes some that are comic. But we also have to look at what we haven't done for a long while because the opera audience here keeps growing and there's always a need to put certain operas on again and again. Bohème is a typical case, something like Traviata, Rigoletto. But when it comes to Beethoven, there is only one choice, and that's Fidelio. And it is a long time since we did it, so it seemed appropriate. But more importantly, we also had a great cast available. And these were primarily people who had appeared successfully in our production of Lohengrin in the year 2000. And I knew with that group it would be a very fine production indeed. So with their availabilities, with the need to do it again, and also with the awareness that freedom and liberty are really a subject on everybody's minds, uh, it seems very appropriate to have Fidelio at this point. Fidelio is a relatively simple story. There's a prisoner named Florestan who has been jailed illegally and his wife Leonora disguises herself as a man, Fidelio, to go looking for him in the prison, which is very courageous indeed. But of course, disguised as a man and a very attractive man, she draws the attention of Marcelina, who is the daughter of Rocco. Marcelina is falling in love with Leonora not realizing that it is a woman because she believes Fidelio is a man. And of course this upsets Giacchino who is the person who really wants Marcelina, but Rocco, the father of Marcelina, is happy about the idea of a match between the two of them because he can see the remarkable qualities that Fidelio has. And those qualities are in fact this, this great love that Fidelio has for her husband, whom she believes is in the jail. So she's searching for him, and there's an evil villain named Pizzaro who is determined to kill him, and she intervenes. She actually saves the life of her husband when Pizzaro is trying to kill him, and virtue does triumph at the end of this opera, which doesn't happen in a lot of operas. And the two are united again, and freedom Reigns. So what we say in our commercials I think is true, let freedom sing, because that's what happens in Beethoven's Fidelio. Der Sieg ist mein, der Sieg ist mein. Stay here. Enjoy your triumph. The yes. triumph is there. There's the goddess of triumph holding. I will win. Hop And then go very far. I hear you. You have good shoes. I don't know. You have good shoes. When San Diego Opera last presented Fidelio, we did an updated version, and this time I was determined to do it in a very traditional style. And I had seen Michael Humper's production in San Francisco when it premiered there some years ago. So it was the obvious way to go, because Michael is a friend of this company, he has done some great work here, including our new production of The Magic Flute a couple of years ago. He's an intellectual director, he is of course German, he knows this music inside and out. Da di da di da di da di. Ah, jetzt will ich runter. Das ist die Stelle. Das ist die Stelle. Ja, Gehst du runter, was dir bequem ist. Aber danach kannst du hier make love to him. Ich kann jetzt nicht so richtig mit meinem Knie love make. Sonst will ich dir das vormachen. Du, da da di. Ja, das kann verrückt. Das kann verrückt werden. Make love. Yeah. Fidelio is a mix of many operatic forms. It starts out as a so-called German singspiel, which is a very simple musical um, theater. It goes on into a highly dramatic, um, you might even say suspense story and uh, the relevant music to it. It has a great revolutionary aspect and it ends nearly as a utopian futuristic oratorio. All the more that there's not only music 
but also spoken text, which is always a difficulty in opera. So as a director, you have to try to blend all these elements and make one convincing piece of them. And uh, you have to very carefully explore how you do that, how you balance one element against the other. And in my conviction, Beethoven helps us in so far as he works out of the contrast. And you should not try to, uh, to close, to plaster over these contract, contrasts. No, the beginning, I think, purpose, on, on, on purpose, is so very simple and so folksy, and you might even say so cute, as a calculated contrast against the horrors of the prison life, which we are to see later, and against the tyranny and sheer cruel power exercised by Pizarro, and that against the sudden and unexpected salvation at the last moment, rather than evening out these contrasts, I'm trying to, to strengthen them and set one element against the other. You can walk to the climax, but not on the climax. All right. The climax is the peak of Mount Everest. Yeah. <laughs> so further you cannot go, or you ruin the peak. Yeah. You tumble. Yeah. So I put great emphasis on the situations, on the characters. Usually, people don't show their emotions. They try to hide them. And only a great pain or a sudden shock or whatever other event makes them show their emotions. A wonderful key example is Leonore in Fidelio. She's in a situation where she has only to hide to hide the fact that she's a woman, to hide her true intentions, freeing her husband, uh, not to show any feelings, and if so, fake feelings, that she is pleased that Rocco takes her as a man and promises her, him, his daughter. Uh, so the whole role practically to the last climactic moment when she shows herself as Florestan wi Florestan's wife, to this very moment she has to hide. Especially she must take great care not to take, not to show feelings. Leonora is just a, 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 it's a fantastic character because she's really she searched for her husband for two years in uh, several prisons in Spain and she can't find him and she has this hope that he is there and it's such a, a role with so many colors also in the music how to sing it it's a very demanding role um, and it's so it's such a mature, wonderful woman and a strong woman and just like me, you know, and just taking care of things and doing things and trying to figure something out to save her husband. Scheulicher is one of the greatest aria ever written for a soprano voice, uh, after, for my, after my opinion. And uh, it's very demanding, but it has so many layers of emotion in it. First, this anger 
against uh, the violent person Pizarro. And then this incredible softness and this hope that every human being needs in our world. Also today, the hope of, of, of peace and for, for finding for, for, for a solution. And then suddenly this, this uh, that she wants to do something about it, this active part in the third part. Oh, it's just a gorgeous aria. <laughs> And then at the final uh, scene when the chorus is entering and Leonora starts to sing, Oh God, welch ein Augenblick. And there is a short ensemble where the chorus is singing and all the soloists. It's just like standing still and thanking God for, for his help and that this thing actually has come to a peaceful end. That's one of the moments where, I mean, or, or when I start talking about it now, I feel the goose is goose hair. How do you say that in English? <laughs> it just starts, my, my hair goes up because it's such a fantastic moment, a religious moment. It's very uplifting. We were speaking before we started the interview about uh, the fact that this is a rescue opera. Uh, it's not a tragedy. Uh, no one dies at the end. Um, some people rate operas by how many people die, uh, but I believe that this is, is an uplifting story, and my character is one that travels through some, some vast emotional um, uh, paths. I mean, he, he really goes from desperation to hope to uh, a little bit crazy, and then gets rescued. And, and you know, uh, to, to be rescued on stage is, is a very uplifting kind of feeling. And I think that that carries over into how I feel about the whole piece. <laughs> As far as the, the makeup for the part of Florestan uh, needing to be a, a dramatic tenor, uh, his character is, is a very strong character. He, he uh, stands up for what he believes is right. He makes speeches. He's, he's a very strong uh, persona that people follow. Um, and while he has been in prison for two years uh, as a political prisoner, uh, he still has that strength in him. And I think that the dramatic end of, of the tenor repertoire, and especially the, the strong voice for this part, is needed to show that power that he, that he possesses. And if it were to be a very lyric tenor, they could certainly sing it. They could sing all the notes, um, get through the part, maybe even easier than, than a dramatic tenor could. Uh, simply because uh, the notes would not be as difficult uh, of a stretch for a lyric tenor. Uh, however, I think that power would be missing a little bit, so I think that's why, why it's needed, uh, why a dramatic tenor is needed for Florestan. <laughs> Why is Pizarro in such a state? Why is he so mean? Uh, I think the perception is, is that he's mean, and I think the root of, of uh, most tyranny is fear. And he's fearful of being caught with Florestan, um, and he says so uh, in the opera. And I think once you start building uh, or using fear to rule, then you in turn uh, become fearful and I think that's that's it's all uh, most aberrant behavior is fear-based I believe <laughs> Die 
I think with with this role and other roles is that there's not much room given to any sort of lyricism uh, and as a singer you're always fighting to to put as much of it in your singing as possible and especially with Pizarro there's a there's a real angular um, feeling in the music which for a lot of singers I know is uncomfortable and and if you're going to do this role you have to embrace it and um, almost use your voice instrumentally uh, in, in many respects um, uh, as opposed to something like Flying Dutchman where you have these huge beautiful lines to sing um, also you do have some very very definite uh, uh, stentorian things to sing as well but it's 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 broken up so you have a chance with Pizarro you're pretty much in in that mode most of the time <laughs> is a character who um, is probably the, the only person in the opera who changes a lot. He is quite fixed in some um, position and he cannot act very much. He just has to react and basically to do what Pizarro tells him. So that's his job since years. And I think he is a man who um, usually needs help from somebody else, in this case probably from Fidelio, who encouraged him to, to stand against Pizarro at the end. He, st he starts this already in this duet, in the first act, where uh, he was asked to kill uh, Florestan, and he says, no, I cannot, I don't do that, no, for sure not. He got money for that, and he wanted to return the money, he said, no, I don't take money, I don't want to do that? I really not. So um, finally at the end when um, he saw that Leonor is even tougher and, and uh, steps in front of Pizarro with a pistol, he is uh, encouraged enough to say okay and now I can uh, do the same because I see how it works. So he steps in front of the minister and tells the whole story. <laughs> Fidelio is an opera. Um, I like the sentence which you put onto the, uh, the, the advertise, advertising that on the, on the, the freedom scene. Yeah. Uh, you can sing, you can express freedom with, with singing. This is the typical. I think um, the story is um, quite basic, but it's not, I would say you couldn't find that everywhere. That a woman goes into a dungeon uh, dressed as a man and tries to find her husband um, working for the dungeon master. That's a tough thing, I think, and that I like very much. So I think that's a good reason to go to this opera, because it's a basic story um, and you can understand very easily, very well. So that's the reason why you should go there. The music, of course, Beethoven. I'm a big fan of Beethoven. I, I love to sing Beethoven. I love to hear the music of Beethoven. Square six. Square six. Ah. 
Christoph Perik, who is our conductor for Fidelio, is making his debut with San Diego Opera, but I've seen his work before in Los Angeles and elsewhere, and I've always admired him. But with only five productions a year, we can never introduce new conductors very often. This was the perfect opportunity for Christoph. music communicate Fidelio is unique because this is his only one and only opera and he worked on it for years and years and years it was not done in one or two years it took him forever and it's a wonderful dramatic score which has incredible uh, writing for the singers for the different roles of that piece and it has also incredible writing for the orchestra for the chorus and as we all know, Beethoven is in first place the composer of nine famous symphonies and five even more famous piano concertos. And you can hear that in that music. It's, it's different from the operas of Rossini or, or, or others or Verdi. It's, it's the music of a symphonic composer. And that's, I think, is the special thing with Beethoven's one and only opera and his Fideo score. <laughs> Funny, it starts out the opera with a, a very careful, not so dramatic first act, and the more the story goes on, the more the drama goes on. We go into the prison, and we go into the dramatic scene between Leonora uh, helping out her husband being killed by the evil Pizarro and the finale. The more and more that, that story goes on, the more the music uh, turns in being more dramatic, louder, getting faster, and uh, so I think the music tells us a lot. And also, uh, we are playing one of the famous four Leonor, Leonor overtures to that piece, where the whole story itself is told in musical terms. Just to remind you that this is kind of unusual. Okay, from the beginning. Beethoven has worked and reworked Fidelio, and actually he had three first night performances of the first version, the second version, and only in the third version the uh, opera was a success. So he wrote different overtures each time, and the most important one is the third one called Leonore III. Uh, which is a very extensive, long concert piece. It is, in other words, a heavyweight. Beethoven's place, and especially the place of Fidelio and the history of opera, is a very important one. When, when he wrote Fidelio, and I I mentioned that he, it took him a lot of years to write that piece. Uh, it's barely uh, 30 years after Mozart did Don Giovanni's and Magic Flutes, and it is not more than just 25 years before a certain guy named Richard Wagner started to write Flying Dutchman. And this is the special situation of Fidelio in between the Viennese classic of Mozart and the upcoming romantic, which is Richard Wagner. And Fidelio is, of course, has a little bit of everything. Beethoven's score is still a real, pure 
Viennese classic music. But there are lots of moments, more and more and more in the run of that opera, which go into the drama, into the romantic sphere of opera, which we, after Richard Wagner, have then forever with all the Wagner operas. And, and so, so Beethoven's Fidelio is really at a, at a very special point in between these two history parts of opera. Nothing is more timely at the moment and, and, and actual and interesting than just Beethoven's message of freedom. And um, so this is not only, not only the subject, the music of course too and everything, but this, this piece I'm deeply convinced will be played also in a hundred years from now. This is such a lovely production. It has been made in the right time. It's not modern in that sense. And it's just such a gorgeous opera. So I really think everybody should come and see that. And of course, we are wonderful. We are fantastic. <laughs> what shall I say? <laughs> Oh, my God.